You're listening to the Erica and McAfee podcast, a faith-based podcast for black women and women of color to share stories of grief and loss due to miscarriage, infant loss, stillbirth, with journeys of trying to conceive and infertility. Welcome to episode 30 of the Erica and McAfee podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial by visiting www.audibletrial.com forward slash Erica. For those of you who are listening in iTunes, please rate and review the podcast. Your reviews help us put us in the ranking of iTunes so that others may know about the show. In today's episode, we have Morgan Goodwin, who shares her incompetent cervix loss story and her new blog, Incompetent But Hopeful. Morgan is married to Marquise Goodwin, wide receiver for the San Francisco 49ers. Morgan was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, before going to college at the University of Texas at Austin. She has a bachelor's in public relations and a master's in strategic communications. Morgan and her husband currently reside in Dallas, Texas, We were introduced to the Goodwins back in November 2017. For those who watched the NFL, on Sunday, November 12, 2017, Morgan's husband, Marquis, scored an 83-yard touchdown on the same day that Baby passed away prematurely. Marquis celebrated the touchdown by blowing a kiss in the sky. He dropped to his knees, and he actually broke down crying in the end zone. In this interview, Morgan takes us back what happened up until that day and that moment when she saw her husband make that touchdown, how her faith in God played a role in her grief, and how she's writing through her newest venture, her blog, Incompetent But Hopeful. Here is Morgan Goodwin. Thank you, Morgan, for being on the podcast. Oh, yes. Hi, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> no problem. Well, uh, many of us may be familiar with you and your story, but tell us about yourself and what you do. Okay, my name is Morgan Goodwin. Um, I am a, uh, I wouldn't say former track and field athlete, but I am a, a hurdler. Um, run for USA, and my husband is in the NFL, and I, um, I, I am just, I'm in school. Well, I actually just graduated grad school, so that's what I'm doing now. And I also recently just started a blog. So, like I mentioned, most of us are familiar with your law story back in November 2017, um, mainly because your husband, Marquise, wide receiver for the San Francisco 49ers, he scored a 83-yard touchdown the same day or maybe within a, a couple hours of when you lost your son prematurely. So take us back to that day and, and share with us your, your lost story. Yes, so um, it all started um, November. Um, what day was that? The 7th? Mm-hmm. No, the 9th or the 7th. And I had a um, 19-week anatomy scan where they were basically going to check my baby's lungs and heart and brain development and make sure that everything was forming properly and while I was doing that everything looked great except for my cervix and my doctor was very concerned that I had already my cervix started already opening it was probably about I only probably had like 0.8 of a centimeter left so it was very 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 short and they would just warn me like hey this is what's going to happen you can either do bed rest or use suppository um, progesterone to, you know, um, help build that, keep my cervix closed. Or either I, I can do a um, cerclage, mm-hmm. which basically with both decisions, I would have a 50-50 chance of survival. Like sometimes it works, sometimes it don't. Sometimes the cerclage may irritate the cervix and cause my cervix to start opening up anyway. But... I mean, my decision was to go ahead and get the cerclage done because I wanted to do everything in my power to keep my baby inside of me. And um, so after that, I went, got got the cerclage. I had to do an amniocentesis where they 
take a, sh- a needle and um, oh my grab goodness. some of the fluid outside. Oh, I yes. Mean, I, I, I've my, heard um, of that. They Yeah, go ahead. To check and make sure that, yeah, they had to check and make sure I didn't have any type of infection because once your cervix start opening, then you have a chance for infection. And if the baby gets infected, it can get into your uterus and then the baby, will, you know, it, the infection will cause fetal death. And then on top of that, um, but the good thing was I didn't have an infection, so they weren't able to put the surclage in. So I got the surclage put in. Three days later, I woke up laying down, um, and I had a big gush of just um, mucus, like my mucus plug. I guess it just opened up and came right on out. So I went to the bathroom to make sure everything was all right. I saw that it was mucus, and I got up off the toilet I wiped and then I just started leaking fluid um it wasn't a lot it was just more of like a trickle type thing coming out and I'm like okay I know I'm not still peeing on myself so I immediately ran to my husband I was like we have to go to the hospital you have to take me to the hospital my doctor told me if I'm leaking that you have to take me back to the hospital and to call them I just immediately went right back to the hospital and then they told me at that point the only thing that we can do is take the shaklage out because at this point if we don't, now you're really at increased risk for infection. So they told me I either I had to take the shaklage out. Now what they could do is send, they're going to send me home regardless. I can terminate the pregnancy at the hospital right then and there, or I can go home and try to you know be on bed rest and keep the baby in. That same night I went home, I laid down. My husband went to meetings because he had a game the next day, which is Sunday. So this was Saturday night. So my husband went to his meetings and came back home. He was actually supposed to stay the night and um, stay there um, because they usually stay the night in the hotel the night before. Mm -hmm. So he ended up coming back home. I guess he just had a feeling like, no, I need to be with my wife at this time because we've been through a lot this whole week. It started from Monday. And went all the way to Saturday. So he stayed and came back home with me. So then after that, we, um, I was, he came back and I was like, baby, I got to go to the bathroom. I got to take a bowel movement, but I'm so scared. Like, please come in the bathroom with me. I don't want to push the baby out. So he was just like, yeah, just sit on the bullet and do not push. We're in the bathroom talking. I get done. And immediately, as soon as I get done, I just started feeling something come out of me. And I'm like, baby, please look, 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 look. What is this? What is this? And lo and behold, it was my sack coming out. So the baby wasn't coming out, but my sack was like bulging out at this point. Mm -hmm. We immediately called my doctor and we called my, um, we called the um, 911 to send an ambulance. And they were just telling me to, is there, like, I'm asking, them, like, what can I do? Like, can I stick it back up in me? Like, what do I need to do? She was like, just stay put. Do not move. Don't do anything. And um, my doctor had finally called us back. Because, you know, when you call a doctor, it goes to a different line. And then they call a doctor and the doctor mm-hmm. call you back. So they told me to um, try and not bust the sack open. So do everything in my power to like keep this baby sack and the amniotic sack inside of me because once the sack bursts, then now we got complications as far as making sure everything comes out mm. at all. You know? So I, the ambulance show up, I'm still sitting on the toilet at this point. So I have like, like six firefighters, um, firemen standing around me and then we had maybe about three to four emt men um no it was actually like probably two or three emt men all surrounding me asking me a million questions while i'm still sitting on the toilet so quite embarrassing Mm -hmm. and um so i um they ended up helping me pull up my pants and get me onto the stretcher safely without, you know, rupturing my sack completely. And um, they took me to the hospital. I got there. The doctor straight up told me there's nothing that we can do at this point. You know, if you deliver this baby right now, that your baby is not going to be viable 19 weeks. It's just way too early to save your unsung, um, your unborn child. At this point, you know, we didn't even know the gender of our baby because we were oh. supposed to have a gender reveal on the 18th. Oh, wow. So, oh, okay. 
well, actually on the 19th, we were supposed to have our gender reveal, and we were going back home. It was going to be his bye week, so which means that he doesn't have any football games. So we was we were going to be going home and having our gender reveal party. So I still had our baby's um, gender inside of an envelope at this point. So they didn't know what our baby was, if it was a he or a she. So they were just like, well, you know, you got to we got to deliver the baby because now you're really at an increased risk of involvement because your sack is already exposed. What's right. going to happen is the sack is eventually going to dry up and burn on its own. So they gave me some medication to induce labor and um before well you know before they gave me the medicine and stuff they gave me and my husband some time to sit and talk about it and we sat and talked about it and um i mean we just had to come to a realization that our pregnancy is coming to an end and uh we opened the gender reveal i let him do the honors of opening the, our envelope the face he made, I just knew we were having a boy because I already had an instinct that we were having a boy. Mm -hmm. And he just started crying. We just both started bawling out. He wanted a boy so bad, too. We, he's been one of the kids for a very, very long time. So, you know, it was hard. It's, it hurts, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but, um, okay, so after that, um, they gave me the medication to induce labor. And... I was having some really bad contractions at one point. Like, it was keeping me up. I think, let me see. Like, they gave me medication starting around maybe 11 p.m. Saturday night. I delivered at 3.52 in the morning. So I was in and out sleeping. Marquise, me and him both squished in the hospital bed just sleeping together. It didn't bother us because, you know, we both sleep on the same side. And we usually, we could fit in a twin bed if we had to because we don't take up whole beds. So we were both in the um, hospital bed. He was asleep. I'm telling him to maybe just get some rest and I'll wake you up when it's time. And um, that's what we did. And I kind of was in and out of sleep. I could get some sleep and then my contractions would wake me up. I would just call the doctor in there and she'll give me another dose of um, some pain medicine to kind of you know, um, tone the pain down. So that happened maybe about three times she came in to give me medicine. Now, the last time she came in, I was like, okay, now I think I need an epidural because this is really hurting right now. Uh, but at that point, it was too late. Once she turned on the lights and sat me up, I mean, the next contraction, my sack just started coming out of me. And I was like, um, excuse me, doctor, baby, like, what is this? What's coming out? Is the baby coming out? Because I could feel it coming out mm -hmm. as I, I had a contraction. So, like, yeah, it's your sack. And then the next contraction, I was like, it's happening again. What is it? They were like, my husband was like, oh, my gosh, I see our baby's legs. And then um, the doctor came in at that point. He came right on time. I mean, the next push, the baby probably would have been all out. But he told me, um, I mean, the next contraction fraction the baby would have probably already had came out but when he got in and looked at it and checked everything he just told me to give him one big last push and I gave a push and everything came out a placenta sack baby still wrapped up in the um sack and everything so he cut the bag open and um cut the umbilical cord cleaned our baby off and gave him back to us and we held him as long as we wanted, and then um, they took him and uh, weighed him and measured him, and then also put him some clothes and put him in a basket and brought him back to us in like a basket, a bassinet basket. Mm -hmm. And he stayed with us the whole night and stayed with me the whole next day. And um, Marquise, um, I had told him he can go ahead and go to the game. Me and our baby was gonna be watching. We are gonna be watching him play. So just go out there. And when he got to the facility, you know, he called and he didn't know what to do. Actually, his pastor, Pastor Earl, the um, team's pastor, Pastor Earl called me and was just like, Mar uh, Marquise doesn't know what to do. He just needs your help. Like, he doesn't know what to do. He wants to come back with you to the hospital. What do I need to tell him? I told him if he is going to feel bad about leaving me here at the hospital and if he's going to beat himself up about it later, then come back. But if not, I am okay. I am okay. We are watching him, and it's all in the Lord's hand. And then he, his pastor was praying for us and everything. So 
we just, he said, okay, he stayed and he played. And me and baby good when our son was just watching him during that game. And it was, you know, emotional watching him and that touchdown and seeing, watching him break down and cry in the um, end zone. I mean, I was bawling out crying. My nurse was trying to ask me, what is, what's wrong? Are you okay? Wow. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm just, I'm just emotional, you know, I didn't tell her what was going on, but at this point, they didn't know that my husband was in a league or whatever, so right, right. I'm just bawling out on the bed, but that was, that was, that was it. He came back to the hospital, and um, he came back to the hospital and, and snuck in, because my curtains was halfway closed, and, and all I, I didn't, I knew it was him because you know the doctors or nurses they knock on the door and then they pronounce who it is and then they come in he stuck in and, and held his hand out and had a football and it was the game ball so they gave him the game and dedicated a ball to baby good win that game so awesome. that was very nice to the team the team was very very you know very supportive and you know and it Thing that he had to do they were going to be okay if he missed the game or if he didn't miss the game they were you know just wanted us to be okay today's podcast is brought to you by audible i finished fire and fury and i would love to know your thoughts on it if you've listened to it if not you can get you a free um audiobook and free 30-day trial by visiting audibletrial.com forward slash erica my February selection for Audible is going to be our February book club selection, which is The Power of a Praying Wife by Stormy O'Martin. So if you're interested in getting that book or joining the Sisters in Loss book club, go to www.sistersinloss.com. And once again, to get your free audiobook and 30 day free trial, visit audibletrial.com forward slash Erica. Once again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash E-R-I-C-A. Um, so were you all able to name um, Baby Goodwin? So he was initially going to be a junior, but obviously if we name him a junior, does that mean we name the second one the third? Like, we just didn't know how that was going to work if we ended up having another boy. So we just stick to baby Goodwin. He's going to always be our um, Marquise, our little Mar- Marquise. But um, as far as if we have another boy in the future, then he will be a junior. It's just confusing to name him Marquise Jr., like Marquise Goodwin Jr., and then have another boy but we would want him to be a junior. I don't know. It's just confusing. No, I understand because um, in my my story, my son was born full term and died right after birth, and he was a junior. So um, it was it was difficult when we got pregnant with our rainbow baby. Should we name him after him and he be a junior as well, or should we give him his own name? Um, but we ended up naming my son Maxwell um, and just gave him a, his own name because of the, the same reason that you just said. We were we were unsure should we rename another child, the other child's name. So um, I completely understand. And it's something that we all, you know, in this community, you know, folks who have had losses, we, we struggle with, you know, naming our baby. But I think, you know, for you to uh-huh. still call him Marquise, um, it's, you still gave him a name. You know, you still whether he's a junior or not, he still has a name. So that's awesome. So tell us how your faith has played a role in your grief journey thus far. Man, my faith in God has just been, you know, keeping us both strong. We, I was talking to my pastor almost every day. My pastor, um, Pastor Ricky Rush out of uh, Dallas at IBOP, Inspiring Body of Christ. He uh, kept texting me and making sure that we both were was okay. And, you know, we prayed about it. And um, I just know, you know, everything happens for a reason. We might not know that reason yet, but just know that, you know, God doesn't make mistakes. And I've been taught that ever since I've, you know, grown up or grown up. So, um But after, you know, praying and my pastor just talking to me and just being saying, you know, everything is going to be all all right. You and Marquise just need to um, be thankful 
at this moment because a lot could have went wrong. A lot could have went wrong. I could have had an infection. They could have had to take my uterus out if I got an infection. Or I could have um, ripped through my cerclage or any something like that. And that could have messed up my whole uterus down there. Or I could have probably died or something. Like, you know, you just have to be grateful for the situation that you're in, even though they hurt. It's just... The, you just got to be thankful for life itself, you know. we very grateful we had the opportunity to even get pregnant because we kind of struggled with um, getting, well, you know, trying for a very long time. So when we did, you know, the loss hurt even worse. Mm-hmm. It's just hard, you know. Mm-hmm. So it definitely is hard. We, um, we just, you know, just pray and we um, keep up with, the Lord and we read the Bible and you know talk to our pastor and everything so that's just what it is we just got to keep our faith you know you 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 don't know the end of the road you don't know Mm -hmm. you just gotta keep your faith so that's just what I've been that's what my husband has been taught with very spiritual people so awesome and I think that we we saw that, especially in your husband's initial Instagram post and then your post after then. Uh, we you know, I was just like, Oh my gosh, they're just so strong and so resilient and they have a platform and they're, you know, you know, just giving God the glory even in this loss and I appreciate that about you all. So let's talk about your blog. What what inspired you to start your blog, Incompetent but Hopeful? And then how do you define that? I'm so glad you asked because, you know, when after the loss, which would happen on the 12th, I started writing my blog maybe around the, I want to say it was that next Sunday. So a week from then, that next Sunday is when I started, you know, writing only just to write, you know, about what had happened. It just kind of helped for me to talk about it. It helped for me to write about it, talk about it. Because it hurt. And, you know, a lot of people don't know about incompetent cervix. So that really inspired me to put it in, you know, perspective. Like, hey, people don't know about this. And it's like a silent baby killer because it happens most people's first pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And they don't know. And then um, and then um, it also can happen to somebody who's also had a baby before. But, you know, something happened or they got surgery or something done or But I just wanted to, you know, bring it to others' attention who don't know about it, plus also empower the women who have gone through incompetent loss. So that's why I did the blog. So I named it Incompetent But Hopeful because I have an incompetent cervix. My Mm -hmm. cervix doesn't hold during a pregnancy. So it is not a good thing, but I mean... That's why I said incompetent, but I said, but hopeful because I'm hopeful and I'm praying. I'm a praying woman. I'm praying for my, you know, my rainbow baby. So incompetent, but I'm hopeful. Awesome. And I also had incompetent cervix with my second loss and very similar. I lost her at 18 weeks. It was a baby girl. We named her Brielle. So with my son, with my rainbow baby, I ended up having to get her cerclage. So I did a whole series on incompetent cervixes on the podcast. September, um, four different ladies talked about their experiences with incompetent cervixes. And one lady in particular had multiple losses. Then she ended up going and getting a trans abdominal cerclage and that's how she was able to successfully have her rainbow baby so let's talk about you know in your most recent blog post you talked about trying again and what you are considering doing going forward so let's talk about that okay yes so my in my recent blog I talked about me doing research and because my doctor had told me about doing a regular cerclage the preventative one which they place at 13 to 15 to 16 weeks which is earlier before your cervix before the baby gets heavy and starts putting pressure on your cervix but as I was going through this um Facebook group called Abby Loopers, which um, some of the women who had incompetent cervix and reached out to me on social media told me about to join. 
there were women on there who have tried this preventative saccage not once, but sometimes even twice before mm-hmm. we're even opting to get the trans abdominal saccage because they thought it would work. I mean, before getting the preventative saccage because they thought it would work. But I did my own research and I come to, I've come to the conclusion that I am going to skip the trying to do the preventative saccage because I just cannot I don't want to lose another baby you know trying to do something what a doctor thought would work mm-hmm. because for me in my situation I lost my baby very early which you sometimes see people lose them around 23 weeks when their cervix failed and they didn't know about it. Mm-hmm. But mine's 19 weeks. So I was pretty, you know, I was halfway through the pregnancy and that's not even far along. So you can't even save a 19 week old. And I was funneling, which means that my sack was actually dipping down, dipping down in your cervix. Yes. My cer- mm-hmm. I was opening up internally. So it wasn't really preterm labor it was just opening up internally very weak so mm-hmm. if that's the case if i get a pre- preventative saccage i'm still going to funnel my my sack is still going to rub against the uh preventative saccage because that's exactly what happened to my you know my um first pregnancy mm-hmm. so i have come to a conclusion that i'm 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 going to skip that step and um go probably go straight to the supply so our next pregnancy i'll be uh trying to uh go do that i understand completely understand and the woman i was referring to is tanika dillard she has a book where she discusses all of her losses she's had multiple losses before she had her trans abdominal saccage and her book is called building a family breaks my heart if you are interested in reading it and it's a really good book about her pregnancy journey and her journey to having children as well and she goes through her details about her trans abdominal saccage and how that worked for her and how she was able to have her rainbow baby and then have another um, she ended up experiencing another loss after that but she still was able to have her rainbow baby through that and have kids I mean essentially that's that was the that was the thing that happened that she that triggered her to be able to have children actually bring her babies home from the hospital so I encourage you to read that book because I think that would be a blessing to you as well and as, as far as the listeners are concerned you can go back to episodes 18 through 21 all of those episodes are the incompetent cervix episodes of the podcast what are some other resources out there for other lost moms i know you mentioned the abby loopers what are some other resources that you have looked into recently um so the abby loopers is the one that i have consistently been on because that's where they had the most information as far as the other uh resources that i have listed on my blog those were resources given to me um from uh, my um, nurse from my insurance nurse actually it's confusing because okay so we're with cigna and the nfl is um they work with cigna so they have the Healthy Babies program where they you um, sign up with them maybe around, I guess, before 16 weeks. And they constantly have a nurse uh, call you every month and check up on you and your pregnancy and stuff like that. Okay. So once I had um, got the Saclage place and they found out about my incompetent cervix, I ended up getting switched over to a high-risk um, nurse from Cigna Healthy Babies Program, and she's the one who actually gave me um, some of those other resources that's listed on my um, on my blog. Awesome. I haven't really got a chance to check them out, all of them, mm-hmm. but I mean, I haven't actually used them myself, but I have gone to their pages and read through their information that they provide, but they definitely provide a support and they provide a base group of women that, you know, help you get through awesome. your loss. Awesome. Lastly, what encouraging words or inspiring words that you can leave with the moms that are out there that have experienced a loss and those who are looking to try again? Okay, so this is my one main thing. Just don't give up. Like, 
I am a fighter. Like, I'm not a quitter. I am a go-getter. If I want something, I'm going to get it however I got to get it. Like, I want a child. You know, I feel like it was my purpose to be a mom. I just feel like as a woman, God put us on earth to reproduce. And I want a child of my own. And I don't want to give up just because I've lost. Even, Even if it might take some time for you to you know, get over your loss and it might take you five years. It may take you three years. Um, I just encourage everyone to keep faith, you know, just pray about it. Even if you're not spiritual, don't give up. Mm -hmm. Keep trying, do everything in your power. If you have to, there's ways, there's so many ways, there's resources that offer you, um, you know, um, even like with, um, search, like there's ways you can save up there's um opportunities where they uh grant you you get grants and stuff for probably you can probably get grants for this i'm not even sure i haven't looked into that but i'm there's ways you can save up and insurance covers um if you've lost multiple and um they have the in pregnancy uh trans abdominal surclage as well some insurances don't cover this uh trans abdominal um procedure pre-pregnancy but they may cover in pregnancy, but I just encourage everybody to not give up and stay, stay positive about the situation. It's hard. It's very, very hard. I seem like, it seems like I'm more sensitive than ever now after my loss. So Mm -hmm. everything makes me cry. So I don't know. It just makes you think about, you know, life and stuff, but I, I just encourage you to don't give up. Awesome. So where can we find your blog and then where can we find you on social? Okay. Um, my blog is incompetent, but hopeful.com. And, uh, you can also subscribe to where every, any, every time I post the blog, you'll get notified through your email, but I, I can also be found on Facebook, Morgan Goodwin. Um, I can also be found on Instagram. My handle is Morgan, AKA Momo. So Morgan, a.k.a. M-O-M-O. And then also you can find me on Twitter. And my handle is Morgan Goodwin. Goodwin has three ends at the end. Thank you so much, Morgan, for being on the podcast and sharing your story and your light and your blog. And I hope that um, one day we can have you back on the podcast so you can share your 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 rainbow baby story. Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me to the podcast. You know, I I really like sharing my story to inspire other women, even though I don't have my rainbow baby yet. But, you know, just my courage and resilience and my fight, you know, to, you know, get my rainbow baby. I mean, it. you ask yourself, why me? But, um, you know, I'm I'm grateful because I, I, I think I've, you know, figured it out, like, why me? Because I have a platform to reach out to other women who may not know or may not have a um, someone to, you know, look at and be inspired by and know that, that there is a way, you know, there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Awesome. Thank you so much again, Morgan. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Erica and McAfee podcast. I pray that this episode was inspirational and a blessing to you. For show notes of today's episode, visit ericamcafee.com forward slash podcast episodes. We now have a Facebook group. Please join the Sisters in Lost community on Facebook by going to ericamcafee.com forward slash community to join in the discussion. This community is for you, the listeners of the Erica and McAfee podcast, and it's for us to dive deeper in discussion of the episodes. We're going to chat with some of the episode guests and discuss questions around grief, loss, marriage, faith, and love. If this group is for you, please visit ericamcafee.com forward slash community to join. I am also launching my Trying Again Grief Coaching Service. This is for those who are trying to conceive after a loss and are looking for that emotional and spiritual support going through that journey. I have three open slots available for coaching. So if this is of interest to you, please visit ericamcafee.com forward slash coaching 
and sign up for a discovery call with me. I look forward to helping you all through your grief journey and your pregnancy after loss journey. Please do not forget to subscribe, rate, and review the Erica and McAfee podcast, especially if you're listening in iTunes. Keep the faith, and I will talk to you next Wednesday.